Okay, a couple more people just joining at the moment. Right, okay, welcome everyone to our February webinar. We've got Claire here with us today for approximately 45 minutes to an hour to discuss um, her tax year end webinar. Um, as per usual, if you guys have any questions throughout the webinar or you've got anything that you would like Claire to go over or clarify, just pop a little question in that um, Q&A box over to your right and we will go through that at the end. We have left some time for questions and there will also be a short survey. So if you do have 30 seconds of time just to leave your feedback at the end, we'll leave it up for you. We would really appreciate it, um, as would Claire. Um, otherwise, Claire, I will leave it up to you. Thanks, Jess. Cool. Hi, everyone. I'll, I'll get going. Um, so, yeah, this is the Tax Your End webinar. Um, so I'm going to focus on sort of key areas, considerations to, you know, take before before the 5th of April. Um, first and foremost, though, the risk disclosure. So this is not financial. Um, this is not financial advice and tax laws change all the time. So that is just a consideration. Um, and I'm sure each of you have very unique and personal situations where, you know, everything I discuss may not be may not be suitable. Um, so I'm Claire, for those of you who don't know me, I've been at AWM for nearly 10 years um, and yeah, been advising for eight of those. So yeah, very experienced now um, and yeah, tax planning is a big part of, of what we do. Webinar agenda, um, I kind of ran over that short, uh, uh, well, I've ran out of, over that earlier. Um, so, you know, the end of the tax year is the 5th of April. Um, so you have until the 5th of April to make use of the planning, planning considerations that I am going to run over. So, first of all, you know, what, what should you be thinking about as the tax year end approaches? Um, what considerations should you make? What actually impacts those considerations? So first and foremost is income. Um, so total income for the year is a big consideration. Is there planning you can do to, you know, maximise that, make the use of allowances, which I will be going through. Return profile of your investments. So what I'm talking about there is, you know, are we targeting growth or dividends? Um, are we targeting tax planning? Savings and interest earned is an interesting one that I've got a few slides on the back at the back of this presentation to go over. Pensions and other tax wrappers, again, a key consideration with what is changing in the sort of fiscal landscape in the UK, um, you know, wrapping up of money and investments um, looks a bit more efficient now than it did a couple of years ago. Um, and then I've just added in gifts there because it's something, you know, we don't really consider as a tax year exercise. Um, however, there is some efficiencies um, in terms of inheritance tax planning. So I will start with current allowances. Um, right now we have 12,570 12, of income, which is called your personal allowance. That is frozen until 27, 28. So, you know, the same this year as it was, as it is going to be next year. This year, the additional rate band was lowered to 125,140. Um, so that is just a consideration on that tax trap between 100,000 and 125,000. Personal savings allowances. So this year you have 1,000 pounds if you're a basic rate taxpayer, 500 for additional, uh, for higher and nothing for additional. Dividend allowances is 1,000 and your capital gains annual exempt, annual exempt amount is 6,000. These are all, um, either getting lower or being frozen. Um, and the impact of that is, you know, to, to increase tax receipts um, in, in the UK. So as I said before, the, the personal allowance is frozen until 27, 28. Um, the personal savings allowance stays where it is. The dividend allowance actually drops to £500 um, per person and the annual exempt amount for capital gains gets halved again down to £3,000. Now, those dividend allowances and annual exempt amounts, um, 
remember those because they come into practice later on in the webinar when I show some you know practical applications of you know, people being exposed to taxes when potentially they're not this year. So starting off simple, we have an ISA. Um, so an ISA is an individual savings account. Um, the money in an ISA is essentially exempt from taxes. So gains you make are not part of your capital gains exposure and income is not taxable. So adults have those um, above 16 years old and children have them from you know the day they're born up to 18 years old. So there is a niche little area when a child between at the age of 16 and 18 where they can actually well where, where you can contribute um, to both um, so the the junior ISA and an adult cash ISA they cannot have a stocks and shares ISA until they are 18 um, but the junior ISA could be invested in stocks and shares pension um, so this year the pension allowance went up um, to 60,000 and that is staying there. Um, so your annual allowance is capped at 60,000 or your earned income if your earned income is lower. Um, if you are a non-earner, so you have no earned income, then you can still contribute up to 3,600 pounds. Again, the growth gains, growth um, returns on the investments within a pension are all tax free and you maintain your tax relief on, on the contributions um, that would be relieved at your marginal rate. For non-taxpayers, um, how it works is you pay in 2,880 and that gets grossed up to 3,600 once it's in the pension. There is some considerations on pensions. Um, it's not quite so simple. So the standard annual allowance, as I mentioned before, is £60,000. If you are a high earner um, and your total income, which includes, you know, dividends, rental income, everything, everything under that sort of income banner, um, that if that is over 260,000, your allowance drops for every two pounds over, you lose one pound of the um, pension allowance. So the maximum you can be tapered is down to £10,000 um, and that is likewise with the money purchase annual allowance um, is also £10,000. Um, adjusted net income, um, so where we've got, you know, frozen frozen barrier, frozen um, bands for income, um, you know, with inflation where it is, we've seen some wage increases across the UK this year. Um, if those wage increases push you into a band, you know, above where you were before. Um, so, for example, if you earned 49,000 49, this year and you're due a pay rise next year, you would earn 52,000. Um, you know, that can impact benefits such as um, the child benefit. The pension contribution actually lowers that gross income amount. Um, so you can get additional benefits by some clever clever pension planning um, in that way. As I mentioned, the tax trap um, earlier. So in relation to the personal allowance, your two pounds of income over £100,000, um, you lose one pound of your personal allowance. Now, what that essentially means is that the income within that um, 100 to 125,000 um, actually gets taxed at, you know, the marginal rate is effectively 60% you know, 40% because it is the higher higher rate and then income that would have been tax free in your personal allowance then becomes liable for 20% tax. So again, you know, if you are someone that's in, in that sort of income band, then pensions can be very, very effective um, for you. Tax incentivized schemes. Um, I know we've done webinars specifically on these, so you know I won't won't dwell on them um, too much in in this webinar. Um, so we have venture capital trusts, enterprise investment schemes, and seed enterprise investment schemes. So up on the screen is venture capital trusts um, contributions um, give you thirty percent of income tax relief. So. You know, if you invested ten thousand and you'd paid three thousand pounds of income tax, you would be able to claim that back. You can invest up to two hundred thousand pounds a year. Um, they do have a minimum hold of five years, 
But I think a key consideration and, you know, lo lots of interest in the venture venture capital trust space is that the, the return profile of a venture capital trust is actually an annual dividend um, in, in most cases. So that annual dividend is paid out tax free. So, you know, if you are someone targeting income, um, these could be very effective um, for you. The EIS and SEIS schemes are, um, you know, 30% and 50% of income tax relief, respectively. Um, they both have CG, well, capital gains, um, tax benefits. So in EIS, you can defer your gain. and SEIS, you actually halve, um, halve your gain. So again, very, very attractive um, when you know lots more, lots more of the UK population is being pushed into um, higher tax rates. Um, they both are a minimum hold of three years, um, and any gains at the end are exempt from CGT. They both are eligible for loss relief, um, but. Yeah, they, they, I think we've done a specific webinar on these um, because there is lots to consider um, when looking at them. But, you know, I would urge you to sort of consider and speak to an advisor um, if if these are, well, if you're thinking these are suitable for you. So capital gains, um, capital gains, we have two, two um, rates. Um, so on Anything other than residential property, your basic rate is 10% and the higher rate is 20%. So what I'm meaning there is that, you know, the gain that falls within um, that part of your total earnings, total income, um, total gains in the year added all together, um, if it lays over the two, you know, the two different tax brackets, um, you could have, you know, some in 10% and some in 20%. Residential property um, is well has, has a surcharge of eight percent. Um, that you know that is staying. Um, the big consideration on capital gains is the allowances. So last year we had twelve thousand three hundred. This year we've got six thousand, and next year it's only three thousand. Now, the efficiency you know of having large gains in a portfolio, um, what, you, what you can invest them, you know, what you're targeting, these cutting in the allowances kind of changes the landscape of, of the, our advice um, in the various structures and sort of the target returns of, of investments. Um, what you can do, though, is if you have had losses, um, given the recent, you know, couple of, last couple of years in the markets, they're there may be some losses that you have realised um, throughout that. Those losses aren't useless in terms of capital gains. Um, if you've realised a loss, you would list that on your tax return and that loss can be actually carried forward to offset any any future gains. Um, so it is an important, well, an important consideration for, for those of you who may have you know, large portfolios that are exposed to gains. Um, if you don't fill in a tax return, you naturally wouldn't, you know, record the losses. But I would certainly, certainly recommend that 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 is something that you um, you think about. Strategies that you can use um, in in the management of capital gains is interspousal transfers. So um, gift gifts between spouses are. You know, exempt from capital gains, um, be that property, shares, um, yes, anything really. If you if you transfer it between um, spouses, then there is no no exposure to gains. Um, you essentially keep keep the initial book, well, the in initial cost of the investment um, as it were. Bed and ISA, so what I mean by that is, you know, realise a position in an unwrapped investment and move it across to an ISA wrapper. Um, an ISA wrapper, you know, as I said right at the start, it wraps everything up to be exempt from future gains. Um, so you would have a realisation in the transaction and getting it into an ISA. Um, however, however, once it's there, um, you know, that, that allowance has been met and future gains um, are exempt. 
Rebalancing unwrapped investments. So an unwrapped investment is anything that's held outside of an ISA or a pension um, or an investment bond. So, you know, if you held shares directly, is is there a benefit to, you know, realising that position, um, making use of potentially your £6,000 gain in this year um, and, and buying a different investment to sort of rebase the, the cost of it. Um, another strategy that we use it, it quite quite regularly is the use of a basic rate band. Um, so, you know, intentionally realizing gains within a portfolio. And we do that intentionally, you know, if you had £20,000 of earned income, pension income, rental income, um, you then have, you know, up to £50,270 that is, um, that is, you know, that gain it, that falls in that band would be only liable to 10% tax. Um, again, if you don't do these before the 5th of April, um, it, well, within this tax year, so before the 5th of April t- this year, um, you lose you lose both the allowances and the ability to, you know, go back and go back and make amendments. Um, so, yeah, important to note that gains, gains and losses are at the point of realisation. Um, you know, unrealised gains and losses don't, you know, don't do anything um, in terms of capital gains exposure. So on to the gifting part. So inheritance tax allowances. Um, again, you know, it's a frozen, it's a frozen allowance. Um, it's been frozen for, for quite some years and, you know, we don't, we don't really foresee this changing massively. Um, so there are things you can do within a tax year. So you can gift £3,000. Um, that is just your annual gifting allowance. If you didn't do it last tax year, you can gift 6000 So 3000 for this year, 3000 for last year. Um, you can, there is an allowance for small gifts um, and wedding gifts. So there are specific other scenarios where there are other other ways of gifting assets, gifting to children, grandchildren, um, friends, anything like that. Um, but yes, you know, ask us about those um, in a bit more detail. The direct benefit of those is that it's if it's within your um, allowances, then it is directly, well, it's immediately exempt from the 40% exposure um, to inheritance tax. So into, I guess, the nitty gritty of um, this year and the key considerations. Um, so one of them, which I know I've spoken to lots of lots of people about, is the state pension. Um, the state pension is, you know, inflation protected. It's it's a very valuable um, a valuable benefit. Um, so the new state pension um, is applicable if you were born after these respective dates. Um, you qualify for it with a minimum of 10 years national insurance um, contributions and you need a maximum of 35 years to be eligible for the full for the full amount the state pension age is increasing um so if you are born between the 6th of april 1960 and the 5th of march 1961 um your state pension is not standard um they are stepping it up sort of month by month um and if you are one of these people you will you know as you can see on the screen here um it will be 66 years plus months um because they're increasing the age up to 67. national insurance record uh, so it's been a hot topic on various programs uh, podcasts and um in conversations so National insurance record is is a key area. Um, obviously, you know, there are people that were contracted out of um, national insurance in terms of their, you know, their, their old pension schemes um, before it got abolished in 2016. So if you are one of these people or, you know, potentially haven't worked for or took early retirement um, and you've got a gap in your national insurance record, you can actually go back and top this up. Um, the uh, well, the deadline for this has changed multiple times. Um, they keep pushing it back. They have had such an influx of requests and national insurance 
contributions that they have actually pushed this out all the way to the 5th of April 2025. Um, and what that is, is the ability to look back pre-2016. So after the 5th of April 2025, um, the furthest you'd be able to look back is expected to be the last six years. So what does that actually mean in practice and how, how can you, you know, a, a, to make the most of this um, this sort of offer that the, the government are making. So those years are charged at a set rate, um, which is £15.85 a week or £824.20 for a full year. Um, so those are the historic rates. Uh, obviously, that goes up, um, which, you know, if you wanted to contribute this year, um, the, it, the cost is, is much higher. Um, so per £824.20 for a full year, you would add it's about £303 um, per year to your state pension. So obviously, you know, that that's um, a calculation that needs to be done and, and everyone's situation is different. But if you were to draw your state pension for, you know, assuming you've got no other income, you draw it for three years and it's all falls within your your personal allowance then, you know, three years, um, three years in, um, you have made your money back. If you are have other income, um, and we allow for basic rate tax, that is obviously just increased to four years to get the net um, benefit. There are situations where some of the years, you know, if you make additional contributions, they they wouldn't credit your um, state pension record. Um, so, the last point there is very, very important um, that, you know, speak to speak to one of us, speak to a financial advisor, or there is a helpline um, within HMRC called the Future Pension Centre. The actual way to make the payments is to contact the Future Pension Centre. Um, they will give you a specific reference number um, and you use that. Um, but you know it could be quite a lucrative, um, a lucrative point for lo lots of people to be considering. The other interesting sort of area, um, and as I said, you know, interest is is now something that you know is real in our lives. Um, you know, for the last ten years, it's not really been any consideration on interest on cash. However, you know, the last year and, and this year, we would see. Um, you know, cash earning earning interest. So one allowance that, you know, isn't really focused on is your starting rate for savers. So that is a maximum of £5,000. It has a taper on it. Um, however, you know, if we keep it simple for the purposes of this, we would assume £5,000 is your starting rate for savings. Um, you also have your personal savings allowance. So again, if we assume, you know, your only income is is interest on cash, um, you would also, you know, and we say you're a basic rate or yeah, not not even a taxpayer. Um, otherwise, you would get the £1,000 personal savings allowance. So in total, there are some people um, that can earn £18,570 in interest. Um, that, you know, it covers sort of bank interest, um, peer to peer lending interest is also covered within there. Um, but you could create yourself an income of £18,570 if this, you know, if this is a applicable to you. The personal savings allowance in, in practice, um, you know, so we here, I'm just, you know, outlining the options that you have as a saver um, and how you can you know optimize those when you're considering cash accounts so for this example i have used seven thousand pounds in a five-year fixed fixed savings account at an interest rate of 4.95 percent you will all know that you can choose to either collect the interest you know monthly annually throughout the term um, or you can roll it all up to maturity so here, if we are collecting 4.95% annually um, on £7,000, you would have £347. Um, that would be your, you know, your interest accrual per annum. 
if we were to roll it all up, um, you would benefit from compounding interest. Um, so all of the cash is re well remains in the savings account and you continue to accrue the, the interest there. Um, the benefit of that means you know, you're better off by £180. So the interest payable at maturity is £1,913. That put into consideration um, in terms of where that leaves you as a taxpayer, um, for a basic rate taxpayer, you would be liable for £183 in income tax um, because the personal savings allowance does not cover your £1,913. Um, it's key to note that you know interest is realized again in the year that it is it is that it is paid um you can't if you if you have a interest paid at maturity account you can't declare that interest annually to make use of the allowances for a higher rate taxpayer um you know that over and above the over and above the allowances um leaves you with a liability of 565 pounds so you know, depending on where you sit in these scenarios, there could be really key factors to consider, um, even when making cash investments. Um, so, you know, highlight here that there are various structures, various manners that you can invest and make the most of the, the high interest rates um, for your deposits. But, you know, there will be an optimal, um, an optimal way of doing that. So wrapper considerations, um, so unwrapped savings and investments, um, like the, the returns from them are more likely to be exposed to taxes, you know, after the 6th of April, because we are cutting the um, allowances. So the reduction in the dividend allowance and the reduction in the annual exempt amount um, is particularly important for those of you with general investment accounts or personal portfolios or, you know, directly holding shares. So um, to put that into real life numbers, um, this is actually the same, the same example I used last year. Um, so if we had £150,000 in, you know, a FTSE all share portfolio, the well, the, the target return is growth and dividends. Um, there is a yield on the FTSE all shares, which is currently around 3.6%. Now, that would produce you um, a dividend income of £5,400. Um, yes, if this is unwrapped, you can't, you know, you can't forego a dividend. Um, you can't opt out of the dividends. Um, it's part and parcel of some, some investments that you have. So the yield after tax is, you know, for basic rate taxpayer is 3.31%. A higher tax rate, a higher rate taxpayer is about 2.49. And then if you're an additional rate taxpayer, your yield drops all the way down to 2.3%. So you can really see the impact of, of what the, you know, reduction in the allowances are, are doing um, and the freezing of, you know the, the the freezing of all all the tax bans um, is pushing lots more people into a taxable position. Um, so one key topic that I've left right for the end, um, which I'm sure lots of you want to hear about, is the abolition of the lifetime allowance um, and the introduction of the lump sum allowance. Um, so this is key key for lots of people. Um, there is lots of considerations to make. Um, and, you know, I really, really urge anyone um, who has questions or thoughts or, you know, could be someone that could, you know, has either old crystallized benefits, um, be that a defined benefit pension in payment, um, previously purchased an annuity, or have actually taken tax-free cash from, um, from pensions um, historically. So the lump sum allowance is now a monetary figure, um, which is, you know, it's set at 25% of 1,073,100. Now that is the lifetime allowance that has been the lifetime allowance since 2020. Um, 
and you know this, this lump sum allowance is fixed um there is something called transitional protection which you know i will touch on um but is the area where some people really need to take action before the end of the tax year um if you are in receipt of a defined benefit pension um and that pension did not or you opted out of the PCLS, um, which was the tax free cash amount and opted for a higher income. In previous years, you, you would have crystallized and used your lifetime allowance um, to some percentage. Um, that percentage of the lifetime allowance use did not pr provide you a tax free, a tax free cash lump sum. Therefore, in the new in the new reg regulations, um, you know, you could actually be entitled to a, a lump sum um, from another source, from another pension, um, because the lump sum is a monetary amount rather than a percentage. At that scenario, um, you you know, there is a transitional protection in place. There is a certificate that SIP administrators, you know, are are liable to provide you um but yes you know i will highlight here that it's a, if you are one of the people that has defined benefit income um, or annuity income or have taken tax-free cash lump sums before um before 2020 then you know really urge you to get in contact with us um for a, for a conversation the other sort of scope of People who need to do some planning around this is people with both defined benefit and defined contribution pensions. Um, the order of taking those pensions is is really crucial, um, and you know a, a time and consideration in terms of that. Do we do it this tax year? Um, do we do it next tax year? Which ones can we do first? Um, should I defer payments? Should I take early retirement? All things like that really come into consideration um, in this tax year. So with that all said, I think that is me done. I was targeting half an hour and I got there. So, so yes, I'll leave this up. Um, and as Jess has mentioned there, if there are any questions, um, I'm happy to happy to answer them. Thanks, Claire. Yeah, we don't have any questions at the moment. Um, so just a couple of reminders from us, we will have a, um, mortgage webinar next month. The date is to be confirmed, but obviously we will send out the invitations as soon as possible. Um, anyone who has signed up for this webinar, um, and those who have attended will all receive copies of both the slides and the recording. Um, so if you do have any questions off of the back of that upon uh, further review, then obviously contact us or contact Claire, and I'm sure anyone will be happy to answer those questions for you. Um, but yeah, no, we haven't had any other questions come through. So at this moment of time, I'll pop up the survey. Like I said before, if anyone has got just 30 seconds of time to complete that for us, then obviously we would really appreciate it. We'll leave it up for about five minutes. Um, and yeah, we'll see you next time. Thanks everyone.